afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank, thank Dr. Walker and NCVH for the opportunity to con contribute to the digital educational series. Uh, I'm Arjun Jairaj. I'm a vascular surgeon at the Rain Center for Venous and Lymphatic Disease. And my uh, talk today is the do's and don'ts of venous access and treatment techniques uh, for venous outflow tract obstruction. I have no financial disclosures pertaining to this talk. Venous obstruction can be grouped as being acute or chronic, involving the native vein or a previously placed stent. Let's consider the scenario of a 26-year-old lady who presented to us with pain and swelling of the left lower extremity. Venous duplex revealed extensive thrombus burden within the uh, iliofemoral segment. This particular duplex image captures the thrombus burden within the femoral and the profunda veins. There was no flow in the common femoral, external iliac or common iliac veins. Given her disabling symptoms, she was taken to the cath lab for pursuance of pharmacomechanical thrombectomy. We accessed the popliteal vein with her in a prone uh, position, and the initial venogram, as you will note, shows uh, extensive thrombus burden starting out in the popliteal vein. We were able to get uh, wire uh, recanalization across the occluded segment, I was interrogation was performed to confirm accurate trajectory of the wire, and then pharmacomechanical thrombectomy was uh, performed using one of the easily available devices uh, off the shelf. She had a very tight stenosis at the level of the uh, common iliac uh, vein confluence, suggestive of May Turner uh, syndrome, and we proceeded to perform angioplasty and stenting in order to provide her good outflow. And this is the completion venogram. We perform IVIS uh, integration with uh, every one of our deep venous procedures. And uh, in, in this particular patient, uh, this is the common femoral vein below uh, the stent. And then you'll see the stented external iliac vein, which is widely patent, as is the common iliac vein that was stented. And this is the IVC above the stent. She's approximately uh, a year out now uh, doing uh, very well. One can also encounter acute occlusion of a previously placed stent. Uh, this is an example of a patient who had uh, this precise presentation. Uh, you will notice the severe post-traumatic changes in the mid thigh, as evidenced by the uh, uh, multiple collat collateral veins that exist in the thigh, and there is no flow within the stent. Uh, pharmacomechanical thrombectomy was carried out in a similar manner as previously noted, and this is the uh, uh, the completion venogram. And you'll notice that this particular patient has been stented all the way to the level of the hepatic vein confluent and has a patent channel. The important point I want to convey with regards to uh, intervention in the acute setting is that complete removal of thrombus burden is not required. Creation of a flow channel is adequate. And when you see these patients uh, at the six, uh, eight week mark and get an ultrasound scan, it's almost as if they never had a DVT to begin with. Moving on to uh, chronic obstruction, uh, as previously noted, it could involve the uh, native vein or a previously placed uh, stent. It can be just obstruction or occlusion. Here we have a 55-year-old lady who presented with disabling pain, heaviness, uh, tiredness, and swelling of the left lower extremity. You will also notice that she has hyperpigmentation and lipodermatosclerosis. Uh, this uh, image represents her uh, common femoral vein. It is narrowed down to 10 millimeters, the external iliac vein down to 12, and the common iliac vein at approximately 9 millimeters. We typically use 12, 14, and 16 millimeters as the diameter cutoffs for the common femoral, external iliac, and common iliac veins, respectively. A CT scan revealed a compression of the uh, left common iliac vein by the right common iliac artery, again, suggestive of uh, May Turner syndrome as the etiology for her uh, symptoms. A few words about venous stenting. Uh, technique as well as purpose of venous stenting is fundamentally different from that uh, involving uh, the arteries. The goal in venous stenting is to reduce peripheral venous hypertension, not restore patency or per promote perfusion as in arterial stenting. It's important to use IVUS interrogation because IVUS reveals stentable obstructions in more than 90% of patients presenting with advanced chronic venous insufficiency that is often missed on use of just uniplanar or even multiplanar venograms. 
Access is typically performed in the mid-thigh vein or the popliteal vein, depending on where there is adequate inflow. And uh, the next step is to uh, place uh, an access sheath. We typically use 11 French sheath uh, for our procedures. An initial venogram is performed to obtain the uh, flow dynamics. And iris integration is performed both pre and post. And in this particular patient, you'll notice that the common femoral is around 109 millimeter squared lumen area. The external iliac is around 116 and the common iliac is around 170. As far as luminal areas go, we use 125, 150, and 200 millimeters squared as the cutoff points for the common femoral, external iliac, and common iliac veins. Anything below this is considered as being stenotic. Angioplasty is carried out uh, typically uh, using uh, 16 to 18 millimeter angioplasty balloons, and it's done in a sequential fashion. And you'll notice the distortion, the contours of the balloon, suggestive of uh, obstructive disease. Stenting, we uh, typically use 16 to 20 millimeter stents. Uh, post dilation is as important as pre dilation. And again, the same balloon that was used for pre dilation is used for post dilation. And as I mentioned before, these are the luminal areas that we use as cutoffs to ensure that we obtain a satisfactory result post stenting. And here you'll notice that the common femoral has gone from 109 to 175 millimeter square lumen area. External iliac has gone from 116 to 188, and the common iliac vein has gone from 116 to 201, all uh, about the cutoff that I previously mentioned. And again, a completion venogram. This was the initial one, and this is post uh, angioplasty and stenting. Uh, important principles regarding stenting. It is essential to exclude all areas of disease, it is okay to stent across the inguinal ligament. Stent as high cranially as needed. Um, and this is an example of a patient who stented all the way from the common femoral vein across the iliac confluence, across the uh, renal veins, uh, across the hepatic veins, all the way to the level of the right edge. With regards to an occluded native iliocaval segment, a few scenarios can be encountered. One is an unilateral or a bilateral uh, chronic total occlusion. You can have a unilateral occlusion in the presence of a contralateral stent, or you can have an occlusion in the setting of an occluded IVC filter. The initial step in all these uh, uh, situations is to obtain wire recanalization, and this can be accomplished uh, using an O35 glide wire supported by a glide cat. Uh, at times, one requires the support of uh, eight French sheath, which is eight French, and it's usually around 45 centimeter long sheath that we use uh, in our practice to support the light cat. And again, once you get into the, uh, the right channel, then it leads you all the way to a segment of patent vein. Uh, the next step is to uh, create a channel that you can stent into. And this angioplasty is typically carried out using a large caliber balloon, like an 18 millimeter, millimeter balloon. At times, uh, you may require a smaller balloon because of watermelon seeding. So I typically use a 12 millimeter balloon and then repeat angioplasty using an ATM. Uh, when performing angioplasty, if the axis is femoral, uh, we typically go caudal to cranial um, with the angioplasty uh, and vice versa with jugular axis uh, because it enables easier retrieval of the angioplasty balloon if it disrupts. And uh, it disrupts fairly often, especially when, when dealing with uh, uh, CTO lesions. And uh, this is an example of an 18 millimeter balloon that was used to uh, perform the angioplasty. And you know, I, it wouldn't stay up as a result of which I had to use a 12, complete the entire angioplasty using a 12, and then go back with the 18 to ensure we have an adequate uh, uh, channel. As far as uh, ipsilateral uh, occlusion in the setting of a contralateral stent, it's important to create a fenestrum, and this can be accomplished again by using a large caliber balloon as previously uh, noted. Um, once you get the wire across to the, through the interstices of the stent, then you use an 18 millimeter balloon to uh, enlarge that interstices to a point where, you, where uh, it can be stented into. With regards to an occluded uh, iliofemoral segment with an occluded IVC filter, it's extremely important to uh, remove the filter if at all possible, even if it involves uh, using a laser sheath if all uh, uh, interventions uh, turn out to be unsuccessful, unsuccessful then uh, we proceed to uh, crush the filter, again, using large caliber balloons. And in this particular case, it was done using a 
uh, a 16 millimeter balloon and then subsequently standing across. So once you've uh, recanalized a segment, uh, performed angioplasty, then the next step is to stent it. And this is a composite stent configuration using a combination of wall and Z stents. And it's important to ensure that you have adequate local areas. Uh, this is uh, following creation of a fenestrum, and it's important to uh, stent into that fenestrum to maintain patency uh, following recanalization. And this is an example of a crushed IVC filter that has been stented across. Uh, this is the completion venogram. As far as uh, recanalization of uh, occluded stents go, uh, the principles are similar to recanalization of the native vein. At times, a uh, laser uh, catheter or power wire recanalization may have to be done as a last resort. Uh, this is an example of a thrombosed uh, 10 millimeter uh, stent. Again, it's extremely important to use adequate size stent and we uh, do not use uh, stent sizes below 14 millimeters. This is an example of a stenotic 8 millimeter um, nitinol stent. And uh, the advantage that the nitinol stent offers is that it can be uh, crushed and uh, relined. And so here it's being crushed with a 24 millimeter balloon. And then this is the IVIS image of following relining the entire segment with an adequate caliber wall stent. This is a sad, sad story of a 26 year old who had, was referred to as after having been stented all the way from the common femoral vein to the hepatic confluence with suboptimal wall stents. And she pre uh, presented with recurrent uh, ulceration of the left lower extremity. And here, you know, we, we have been, we were successful in getting across and um, performing the angioplasty initially with a, with a 12 millimeter balloon. And uh, then subsequently I go back with an 18 millimeter balloon. The problem with wall stents are unlike nitinol stents, you really can't fracture and reline and uh, uh, they expand only so much even with the use of the largest caliber balloons. So while we were successful uh, in, in the recanalization, it was, uh, it was short lived. So the important take home point here is that uh, do it right the first time around, you know, seldom do these procedures offer a second chance. As far as our anticoagulation um, perioperatively goes, uh, we typically uh, pursue like 12 weeks of therapeutic anticoagulations uh, in the post recanalization setting. Uh, people who have uh, thrombophilia require longer durations of uh, anticoagulation. As far as additional agents go, uh, we have used aspirin 81 milligrams as well as uh, silistazole 50 milligrams twice daily for their ability to retard instant ray stenosis. With regards to follow-up, we typically obtain a post-operative duplex the day after the procedure and repeat duplexes at uh, two and four weeks. Um, so Long-term follow-up is typically required. Closer follow-up is required for patients who have undergone recanalization procedures as compared to those who have undergone stenting for an obstructive lesion. A few words on complications of venous stenting. Uh, a variety of complications can be encountered. Access related are similar to what one would encounter with access of the arterial system. Uh, hematoma, pseudoneurysms, AV fistulas, and they are treated in pretty much the same way. As far as venous injury goes, rupture, uh, free rupture, it's extraordinarily rare because of the low pressure as well as the intense inflammation and periodic tissue fibrosis that occur around these veins. Uh, however, there are instances in the literature where cover traps have been used to exclude uh, a site of uh, rupture. And this is the example of why uh, free rupture seldom occurs. You can notice the extensive fibrosis around the vein, uh, which has an IVUS catheter in place. As far as instant restenosis goes, it represents the most common reason for reintervention um, following placement of a venous stent. The overall incidence uh, is quite high. However, uh, very few of them actually require a reintervention. It's important to remember that ISR is not relentlessly progressive to stent occlusion, and just mere presence of an ISR uh, does not warrant intervention. ISR has to be accompanied with recurrence of disabling clinical symptoms to warrant in intervention. This is an example of a patient with uh, severe uh, instant restenosis that was managed with angioplasty with large caliber balloons. We typically use balloons the same size or larger than the stent involved. Uh, at times, even that doesn't work. 
and you have to uh, ablate the ISR using a laser catheter and then pursue a repeat angioplasty. Stent compression, a phenomenon that is more or less unique to veins, uh, fibrotic changes around the vein cost, uh, cost stent compression. Uh, it's less common than instant restenosis and it's handled in the same way as uh, stent compression is, as uh, instant restenosis by angioplasty with large caliber balloons. However, the success rate for uh, restoring a size stent to its original size is much less than uh, treatment of ISR with angioplasty. As far as stent thrombosis goes, our experience, in our experience, the incidence is close to around 3%. Um, it usually results as a result of poor inflow, outflow, undersizing of the stent, uh, inadequate uh, coverage of all areas of disease, or lack of perioperative use of antithrombotic agents when there is a clear need for the same. This is an example of a patient with uh, acute occlusion uh, of the stent and uh, post uh, lysis. Contralateral iliac vein thrombosis uh, arises as a result of jailing of the opposite side uh, from the uh, stent uh, that was previously placed. Um, and uh, the treatment of this would be, as previously mentioned, creation of a fenestrum and then stenting into this if needed. However, this can be prevented by using a combination of wall C stents, sort of a composite stent configuration. And with use uh, with the uh, uh, arrival on the market of dedicated venous stents, it should represent less of a problem because you only have to go a couple of millimeters above the iliocable confluence uh, with use of either the uh, barred venous stent on the left side or the uh, venity stent on the right side. Uh, the two commercially available dedicated stents currently in the United States. Stent migration uh, can occur. Uh, it's dependent on the landing zone. Um, that's the cranial landing zone. It is extremely important to cross the iliac cable confluence and uh, use of a Z-stent can be protective against this uh, phenomenon. And there's an example of a distal migration of a wall stent. Um, distal migration can be prevented by use of uh, by, uh, extension of the wall stent all the way to the contralateral cable wall if you have access only to the wall stent. Um, if you have access to wall and Z stents, then uh, using that composite stent configuration uh, prevents the distal migration. But with the newer dedicated stents, you know, a couple of millimeters across the iliac cable confluence uh, should be adequate. So points to remember, it's essential to use ultrasound guidance for access to keep oneself out of trouble. IVUS helps with confirmation of diagnosis as well as guiding treatment. It is okay to stent across the inguinal ligament, stent as high cranially as necessary to ensure adequate outflow. In recanalization, start with a large angioplasty balloon and avoid repeating the venogram. With suboptimal nitinol stents, fracture and reline, anticoagulate as needed, and recanalization patients require closer follow-up than those stented for obstructive lesions. In essence, Iliocable stenting can be performed with minimal morbidity and mortality. Thank you very much.